we're going to uh, talk about uh, uh, turning cars into batteries. We're going to talk about this, this vision that's been around a long time, which is uh, just starting to see the beginnings of, which is how do cars, this, uh, the electric vehicles, this, this growing, growing fleet, um, become part of the grid? And what does that mean? How does that happen? Um, and so, uh, so starting at the end, we have uh, Rob Threlkeld from uh, General Motors. Uh, in the middle, we have uh, Brent Hollenbeck from, from uh, Timber Rock. And we'll learn more about all, what all these is. And Paul Pebbles here, from, also from GM. Um, so uh, what, we'll just sort of quickly go down, starting, starting with you, Rob, in, in terms of where do you sit? What do you do? What's your relationship to this topic? Sure, I manage our global portfolio of renewable energy, so I do get to travel the globe as well. But I also saw the need for really marrying what we do on the facility side with what we do on our vehicle side. So that's kind of how I've been able to you know, really work through a lot of our areas within General Motors, such as OnStar, and marrying renewable energy with, with battery storage and EVs. So what are you doing on the facility side, and how does that map on the, to the products? <laughs> sure, on the facility side, you know, we've got about 40 megawatts of solar on our rooftops right now, and I thought... What a great way to be able to use in the OnStar app to charge your vehicle with, uh, with the renewable energy and then kind of marrying solar electric vehicle charging stations and smart grid technologies with, uh, with renewable energy and electric vehicle charging. Okay, let's, let's, we'll come back to that. Brent, what is Timber Rock? Uh, we're a technology-enabled energy infrastructure company, which is a mouthful. Uh, but basically what we do is we develop uh, distributed generation projects, uh, solar, storage, EV infrastructure, uh, and then we have software that manages and optimizes it. Uh, we've been working with GM for a couple years, uh, doing increasingly complex projects with them, initially around solar and EV, now really basically deploying full-blown microgrids, uh, most recently at, the, at GM's e-motor plant. So you're building micro, explain that a little bit. What does that mean, a microgrid uh, in relationship to, to, to GM and electric vehicles and solar? Sure. Uh, so one of, one of the things we wanted to do um, at the e-motor plant was to develop a, a system that incorporated renewables, stationary uh, storage, uh, EV charging infrastructure, and then also pull the, the, the electric vehicle fleet into, into the mix and really show that how, how all of these assets are part of this orchestra that we have to conduct to make these things work. So uh, obviously GM has a strong interest in uh, the proliferation of EVs, and we wanted to show really how you put all these pieces together, uh, both technically, but then more, more importantly, really from a, a business model point of view, so that fleet buyers or others can say, hey, these, these assets that we'd like to buy ha have value that we can extract th from them as, as grid resources. Okay. And um, Rob, where do you sit in, um, in I mean, sorry, Paul. Paul, where do you sit in GM? Yeah, so I'm in the uh, Global Connected Consumer Group, which is basically uh, OnStar and Infotainment merged together. So, so OnStar is a division of General Motors. It is, yep. And it's now housed within this GCC organization. So we kind of combined our OnStar business unit with our infotainment business unit into one, one group now. So most people know, uh, have some familiarity with OnStar. It's the button you press that's, that's right. up there in the roof and, you know, you've seen the great commercials about, you know, the mother coming to the parking lot with the kid locked in the car and, you know, how do I help me here and, and, and other situations where that's, you know, you know about unlocking and about emergency getting the, into an accident and, and help comes to you uh, immediately. Uh, but what else is OnStar? Why, how does OnStar want to fit into all this? Yeah, so um, OnStar is our connectivity. It's our pipe into the vehicle. Um, so for about three and a half years now, we've been developing proof of concepts, uh, demonstrations around how do we allow that connectivity to be used by utilities or energy companies to, to access the data and the control from our vehicles? Um, the exciting part for us about Timber Rock is now this is going beyond just the proof of concepts, the demonstrations. This is, they're going to be really driving these vehicles, they're going to be living with these vehicles, and it's going to be connected through our smart grid APIs to allow them to control those vehicles. So, so let me try to, sort of in plain English, sort of think, set what I think is the vision here. And, and you tell me if it's, if it's true, but the idea is that, uh, that the, these, all these cars together, the electric vehicles have all these batteries, and it becomes this big rolling storage unit collectively, where in a distributed way, uh, the, uh, there's energy stored there that can feed into the grid on, a, on an on-demand basis, um, and in some way that with the driver or the owner of that vehicle has agreed to be willing to share some percentage of that and to still have enough energy to get home. Uh, and, uh, and, and hopefully make money in that long process. Is that just in a very lay f description, is that sort of what we're talking about here? Yeah, it's, it's pretty close. The one thing I would caveat there is it's not bi-directional. So the only thing that you can do is either cause the, the volt to charge or to stop charging. So one of the things that we hear a lot about is 
how does, uh, you know, does the vehicle have the ability to push energy back into the grid? And the answer is no. Not um, yet, but is that part of the vision? I don't think it's necessary. Oh. So if you start thinking about ancillary services, if I have two volts parked right next to each other, turn one off, leave one on. Um, if you wanna add more energy to the grid, I shut one off. If I wanna take more energy from the grid, I turn the second one on. So by having um, multiple vehicles plugged in simultaneously, I can create that same exact effect without actually um, having the bi-directional feature in the vehicle. Okay, so, the, so uh, all right, so that, uh, that vision of rolling battery storage for the grid is maybe someday, maybe not. Um, the capacity, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so Brent, why is this now sort of the time? What's changed that this is now becoming uh, a, a viable technology? Well, I think there's really two things. Uh, one is the volume of EVs are increasing. And so if you think about that as an asset that can provide a service to the grid, as you get more, that, that you, you can actually not push the grid around, but you have enough that you, you, you can begin to start moving the needle a little bit on that. I think the other thing that's um, I, I really exciting, I think is exciting, as Paul said, it's sort of not a lab experiment, it's, it's real world, is the, the whole notion of V to G has always been, well, what's, we, we understand there could be some benefit derived here, but what's the cost of the infrastructure? So V to G is vehicle to grid. Right, and go, keep going, I just wanna make sure we're all with Yeah, so, uh, so I'll be precise, uh, using the vehicle as a grid asset, never exporting power, but using it as a grid asset for balancing or firming, which, which can be done, as, as Paul was describing. Uh, the ability to do that at a very low cost via the OnStar connectivity is I think what's really exciting because you're talking about no off vehicle infrastructure required in the case of what we're doing with Timber Rock uh, our, we're talking to PJM, the Grid Balancing Authority. Our software talks directly to OnStar. It, it, there's really no hardware required. So we're, we're leveraging an asset, bidding it into a uh, ancillary services market opportunity with no hardware. I'm not sure we're still uh, as clear as I want this audience who are not experts necessarily in this, some more than others, in terms of how this balances the grid, but it's not feeding into the grid. Can, who can give me... Uh, a, a plain speak explanation of that. Sure. Well, so think about maybe a thousand electric vehicles all plugged in. Okay, so this is one big, fairly steady load, right? And we know that. In terms uh, of how much they're taking off the grid in that moment. Yeah, so, a, so, uh, say they're, they're all plugged in, we're all at work, all vehicles are plugged in with workplace charging. They're all plugged in, that load's very stable, relatively stable. Now, we know to keep the grid in balance, the balance equation between generation and load, a balancing authority is always having to, to manage this, right? So that big load, what we can do, and, and we aggregate all those vehicles together, and we modulate the charge from a low kilowatt hour charge up to a higher one. In so doing, we're providing a balancing effect to the grid, never net exporting out of those batteries, but modulating from a zero kilowatt charge up to the full charge in conjunction with what the grid is telling us it needs. So we're never exporting power, but we're moving that load around in a way that balances the grid. So this is demand response, except that the, the, the collective uh, uh, electric vehicle fleet is, is serving as this instead of, a, let's say, an office building in terms of uh, powering down or taking less energy instead of having to fire up a peaker plant that's needed when that extra amount of power is needed into the grid. That's right, that's right. Okay, okay. so, so what, again, what, this is happening now because the technology is changing. Is there, are there the policy piece that's changing? Uh, or just uh, is it because the system, different parts of the system are finally talking to one another? Uh, what's going on here, uh, Rob? Yeah, I think it's really, it's linking a lot of the systems. I'm a facilities person, but working in a big company like General Motors, who's got the assets of OnStar, who's got the assets of R&D, who's got really a, a bulk of bringing all those assets together, and how do we leverage that as a company as a whole to really Im improve the business case of electric vehicles, but as renewable, en renewable energy as a whole as well. So we engage the solar component of that as well. Uh, we've engaged the vehicle component, we've engaged the utility component, and it really it's leveraging all the assets that are out there to really maximize the efficiency of the grid. So why would I, as an EV owner, want to subject my car to this kind of thing where you're gonna, you're gonna the utility is gonna say, uh, I, you can't get as much power as you thought you were gonna get right now because somebody else needs it. What, what's the benefit uh, yeah. to, you know, to so doing this? Yeah, the reality is, is if, if we're affecting how the person's using their car, then we have failed. Um, and through software, and we've proven this many times over and over again, you know, the, uh, the Google PGM demonstration we did um, a year and a half ago where we controlled their 25 volts, 
match that back to renewable energy generation to prove that it can actually happen. Um, for the homeowner, if, you know, most homeowners actually come home, park their car, and don't leave in the morning. That's not everybody, but the majority, and it's usually 10 hours. On level two, it takes four hours to charge. So we really have like a six hour window where we can be moving that charge around. Level two is a slower charge rate than uh, Level two is a 240. A 240. Uh, yeah, okay. level one is uh, 110. Okay. Um, so, but within that 10 hours, if you're fully depleted, it only takes four hours. Um, and the reality is most people aren't fully depleted when they charge either. Um, but there's a large time where that battery, that acid is just sitting there, either fully charged or waiting to be charged, not doing anything. By controlling that in those off hours when the customer's not using the car, they'll never know that this stuff is going on. They, of course, have to opt in, but it won't impact their lifestyle at all. Will I get anything for that? We're still trying to work through that. Now, in the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about me. Yeah, you personally? <laughs> um, we'll get you a vote for a week. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, in the, our expectations, the answer is yes. And actually, in, here in California, you know, the utilities are now actually starting to leverage some of these technologies. Um, you know, we can build a car faster than we can get a utility to sign on for advanced technology. Um, the, the reality is that that now with uh, CalISO, um, PG&E, some of the other utilities are now starting to embrace some of this technology. Our cars since 2012 have been enabled with this. Every vehicle that we're gonna produce going forward, the Spark EV, which is already out, the ELR that's coming soon, the cars after that, um, they all have this technology built in. Uh, the reality is it's still gonna take some, some convincing, um, but our vision is if there's no benefit to the customer, nobody's gonna sign up to do it. Um, there has to be a benefit for us. As Brent was mentioning earlier, from an infrastructure perspective, this is by far the cheapest solution that a utility can use to actually get the access to these batteries. So what's the benefit to, to GM and Timber Rock? You're not utilities, you're not in the business. What, what, what's the... Yeah. Uh, you know, from, I can speak to Timber Rock's perspective. You know, we're very interested in new distributed generation and distributed energy resource deployments, right? Uh, and and, and to get these systems out, especially if you're talking about a microgrid where there's lots of pieces, you have to derive revenue streams that are behind the meter and in front of the meter. So you, you have to be yielding some benefit to the grid or the grid balancing authority. Uh, to be an income stream into the project so you can get more of these assets deployed in the first place. So we, we have a really keen interest in demonstrating that there, there, is, there is value in doing this, that you can monetize the value, and that ultimately you can bake that into the project finance uh, so that more of these cleaner, more renewable assets can be deployed. So I would imagine that, no, no, I imagine, GM is not the only company that, that has electric vehicles, as right. you well know. Uh, and it's not the only company looking at this. We had sitting here yesterday, um, Lyndon Rive, the CEO of, of Solar City, who is related in numerous ways with Tesla, uh, and they are creating the home charging for Tesla. And I know you're not Tesla yet, but I know it's been, there was a headline just a couple of weeks ago, GM plans to compete with Tesla at the mass market uh, level vehicle in EVs in 2015, 16, somewhere in that time frame. So, you know, putting GM and Tesla in the same sentence is not as outlandish as some people may initially think. Um, Rob, how does this, uh, or any of you, uh, but let's start with Rob, uh, there is this interoperability challenge across so many of the technologies that we're talking about here at Verge. Um, how is that going to work when Nissan and, and Tesla and BMW and, and everybody else has some similar kind of system also looking to play with the utilities. Are they gonna to work together? You know, I would say at some point they all have to work together. I mean, look at the comma plug for the electric vehicle. I mean, it finally you just got a cell phone chargers that you can actually use the same charger and use it on multiple phones. So I Not think yet. that, you know, we started that with the electric <laughs> vehicle. You know, they only need one plug when you look at that. So, I mean, we are working together on those types of applications. You know, I think there's no, you know, as I look at what Tesla's done and some of their solar charging and obviously working with Solar City. You know, we've done solar charging EV canopies as well. I don't think that's really any type of, uh, you know, an advantage to any car company. It's really about greening the grid and it's really about green, driving your electric vehicles with green renewable energy, which I think a lot of folks that are driving uh, electric vehicles are very interested in doing. In fact, the OnStar app has the capabilities to allow you to talk to the utility and determine when there's actually right. green energy on the grid. So, uh, you know, I think it's not really, it's, it's really something that all the car companies should work on when it, in regards to uh, supporting this type of electric vehicle infrastructure. But, but Brent, I'm asking a really specific technology-related question here. 
is it going to be plug and play if I have a Leaf or if I have a Volt or if I have a Model S Tesla, will I be able to have the same kind of arrangement with my local utility uh, in, or, or, my, or the solar panels on my roof that will make this uh, seamless plug and play? So, so it's, I, I think it's tr tr fair to say that there's going to be differentiate differences between the cars in the same way there's difference between solar inverters versus different battery solutions. <laughs> there is a role, I think, uh, for a middleware aggregation piece. So even though the, the hardware solutions can be disparate, if they can feed into the cloud, if I can use that overused term, uh, to an aggregator uh, that really looks at whether it's a bunch of different cars or a bunch of different cars with some bat stationary batteries or PV systems, aggregate that up into blocks of capacity that then can be bid into these, these you have to present this aggregation of assets up to the grid in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that the grid can make sense of it. So there is an aggregation or a middleware layer that is required. It, yeah, so um, you know, Tesla is kind of an outlier, right? Um, they don't follow the J1772 plug standard, although they what offer. What is that? J1772 is this plug around the globe that will work to charge your electric vehicle. So, um, of all automakers, there's only one who doesn't use it, and that's Tesla. Although they will, for a fee, everything's a fee, um, charge you for an adapter cord so that you can use it if you want. So. Um, I will tell you that you know um, there are areas where we compete and there's areas where we collaborate. Um, when it comes to how do we leverage our vehicles to help the grid, um, we collaborate. I don't care if it's BMW, Toyota, Ford, Nissan. Matter of fact, I'll be at Ford headquarters next week. Um, we are very actively working on that. Uh, we're not ready to announce um, how that's going to work, but to Brent's point, um, one of the complaints that we've heard from the utilities is we were the first in this space years ago with our APIs to allow you to do this level of control. Um, and that's the biggest complaint that we've heard from utilities is, well, it's great that GM, who's got the most vehicles, can do this. But what about when Ford comes along and Toyota's got a large volume and all these other things? So um, with the help of EPRI, um, we have been working towards that. Um, Electric Power Research Institute yep. down the street in Palo Alto. Yep. So they've been very helpful in trying to address these types of issues. And, and to be perfectly frank, um, as automakers, we have come up with a solution um, that we hope to demonstrate next year that will work where I don't care which vehicle you have, you're going to have the same types of services available to you. Our biggest challenge to date is that the utilities have not been fully on board. Um, they don't like to relinquish control. It's not, they're not used to allowing other people to you know, control assets in their grid. Yeah. Um, and as automakers, we've got to ensure that they're not going to damage our cars. So it's a, there's always this little tension there. But right now, as automakers, we're all on the same page. Um, we're just waiting for the utilities, and EPRI's going to help us with uh, getting them on board, hopefully, to demonstrate this really working next year. Yeah, I want to get back to the utilities in a second. But Brent, are you working with other car companies? You know, GM is my <laughs> favorite customer. Yeah, good I, answer. I'd good like answer. to leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we are actually um, we we are doing a little work uh, with other auto manufacturers, but from a Timberrock perspective, the one point I would make is that a car is just a distributed energy resource to us in the way same way in a solar system or a, a stationary battery. And in fact, at, I mentioned this microgrid at the GM facility uh, outside of DC. Um, we actually are managing a fleet of EVs like, as we've been discussing, but we also have stationary lithium-ion batteries there in which we are doing that actual discharge to the grid. And we're actually managing the cars in one way, the, the stationary batteries in a slightly different way. Um, so it's really, it, it's really putting these different assets. They have their own characteristics. You have to understand and characterize it, then aggregate up, and you get this bigger block of capacity that you can help the grid with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we hear a lot about uh, big data. We like to talk about fast data. If you think about a bunch of different types of cars, or is the sun shining, is it not on a solar system? What's the battery doing or not doing? This data is coming in very quickly, and you have to make very fast decisions about it. Um, we leverage a complex event processing engine that we shamelessly stole right out of the financial trading industry that can make really fast decisions really quickly. So as, as, as important as big data is, fast data, when you're trying to do, do this aggregation, is equally important. So what, what is that data trying? What, what are the decision points? What are the different criteria that it's looking at to make what kind of decisions? They're very complex. Uh, they can be different tariff structures uh, that a, a commercial customer might be exp have from their utility. There might be market opportunities at the uh, grid balancing authority level. So there might be a number of market opportunities that these combined assets, 
they can, they can move this energy in different ways, depending on what yields the greatest economic value. Maybe I want to push it in the building so that building reduces a demand charge they were about to tip over. Or maybe they're not in risk of that, so we'll bid it into an ancillary services opportunity. So every location is different, but it's understanding how you get the assets together, what's the market opportunity, then how do you make really smart decisions about leveraging this, this, this combination of assets uh, to yield the best economic returns. So I want to get to a question in a second, but I'll ask one more right now. That what's the, is there a barrier to adoption? It sounds like it's kind of coming together. The car companies, they're talking to one another. There's some technology pieces in place. There's certainly the, the solar assets on roofs that are available to help on the charging side to really make this a green energy uh, opportunity. Uh, is it simply matter, is, this, is there a barrier that still uh, is in place? What's it going to take? Yeah, from, from my perspective, probably the, the biggest and best area that we need to focus on collectively is the public utility commissions. The commissions um, themselves. The commissions themselves, which, because which, they're trying to you know, regulate and, and live to 7,500-year-old standards, and, and this technology is well beyond that. Our cars are ready. Other automakers are coming along. Um, and you know, the, the usual answer that we get back from the utilities is they're doing everything they can, but are still bound by the PUCs to do research and development projects. I mean, there's several that we've done this year in, in California, but obviously with all the budget crises and other issues, they haven't been able to be funded. But the fundamental model of how the PUCs are working, there's, there's real opportunity to improve that, um, to really take advantage of this technology. The technology's here, it's ready. We're able to show it with Timber Rock in, in Maryland. I, uh, I, I personally PUC. drive one of these vehicles that, that we're managing in this way, and it doesn't change how I drive it. Um, but the barriers that you see? I, I, I'd, re I'd really echo Paul's point. I, I mean, I think it's uh, the technology is there, the ability to aggregate, put it, the pieces together are, are there. Um, you know, I really think this is an opportunity for utilities, too, uh, to say, hey, I've got a lot of EV drivers. I, I know I have to start thinking differently, you know, the whole death spiral conundrum for, for yeah. utilities. If they can go out and rope, put their arms around and show some love to their EV drivers, monetize it for them by doing these things, I think it's an opportunity for utilities to expand some services right. and, mm -hmm. and do some interesting things. So policy is, seems to be the big change that's needed here. Do you agree with that, Rob? Are there yeah, I, I would agree full heartedly on that. In fact, obviously, anytime we do large-scale renewable projects on our facilities, you know, I've advocated in front of the Ohio Public Utility Commission. We've discussed some of these high-tech technologies, and they kind of kind of close their eyes almost onto that okay. right now. They just don't understand it. Mo, let's take a quick question. We, we've got a question from Dame, Dave Weinreth who's asking, are the folks who underwrite the battery warranties, and that may be GM or it could be uh, another party, supportive of batteries being used in these manners uh, ah. for grid stability? Great question. Yep, 100%. Uh, this doesn't affect any of the warranties, and, and the fact that it's going through OnStar, which is a GM-owned entity, um, ensures that we're not going to do anything that's going to damage that. Um, you know, even, and I hear a lot of little startup companies want to control the charging of the battery, and they do it through the plug, the P, the, the EVSE, the charging station. The reality is even if you try to come in that method, we've got algorithms and software in our vehicles to prevent bad things from happening. If someone tries to cycle too quickly, we, show, we do a fault and you can't charge for a while. So we, we will do everything to make sure that we're not going to damage the customer's uh, batteries in any way. Yeah. Well, we've actually just run out of juice on our clock here, so we're going to uh, move on. Um, but it's uh, great technology. We're on a, on a nice, uh, hopefully, glide path to... Uh, Ad adoption and we'll come back next year and hear how it's all working out. So please join me in thanking Rob, Paul, and Brent. Thanks, guys. Thanks.